We will be on break. Thank you. See the PubMed database. Uh, PubMed database. You see uh, that particular database is basically focusing on the you know medical breakthroughs, medical papers, or uh, biomedical uh, discipline, biomedical uh, areas, etc. Now, this is one of the uh, you know databases. This is one of the platforms that I have shared with the students and scholars that you can use is Dimensions.ai, which is a free platform. And from, from where uh, you can actually apply a lot of filter uh, in identifying the papers. Now, you see, um, for example, when, when we are conducting a bibliometric analysis or by using data directly from the Google Scholar, and if I compare the quality of the bibliometric analysis based on papers uh, streamed from Scopus or uh, papers streamed from uh, you know, Google Scholar, the basic problem with Google Scholar is it has certain restrictive features so when it comes to extraction of the paper features in a CSV format or a BibTeX format or a RefMan format or an EndNote format or an RTF format, okay? In whichever format you are exporting, suppose you are exporting in uh, .CSV format, if you check the uh, bibliometric data uh, that Google Scholar fetches, two uh, particular parameter or two particular components are absent in those uh, uh, particular matrices, matrices. One is the Google Scholar cannot extract the abstract of the paper. This, this is a big drawback. And the second thing, the Google Scholar cannot extract the index keyword. Uh, they can extract the author's keyword, but not the index keyword. Now there's a subtle difference between the index keyword and the author's keyword. The author's keywords are pretty limited in nature. So, you know, for every paper, there is a limitation to put uh, into certain number of author's keyword. It is maximum five to six. But the index keywords are basically some critical words other than the, in addition to the author's keywords, which the author could not put forward because of this, uh, because of that restriction. Since we, we are told by the journal format or the journal template, that you can maximum uh, have uh, um, five to six keywords. So it is restricted within five to six keywords only, whereas this you know, keyword plus or index keywords, uh, either of these two terms are valid. Uh, it, it, it will give you all the keywords which are very critical in the context of that particular paper or of that particular research that, uh, that, 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 that particular paper uh, dealt with. So um, that 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 is one of the difficulties. But uh, in, in case of you know, if if a particular um, scholar is not having access to Scopus, uh, the fundamental recommendation that we provide is to copy the abstract of the individual paper, create a separate column, and insert the abstract. But that 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 again is a very painstaking job. So just imagine the labor that that guy has to put in. Uh, if he or she has downloaded some 100, 150 papers, copying the abstract of that many paper and inserting them in a, in a separate column, it's a very tedious job. So that is that is one of the uh, you can say limitations of uh, you know getting uh, it from the Google Scholar, which is actually a free source. Uh, but then I tried with Dimensions.ai. Dimensions.ai almost replicated uh, uh, Scopus. So it gave me that particular opportunity uh, to extract data uh, in almost a similar template uh, that was provided to me by Scopus. So the abstract and the additional keywords, et cetera, et cetera, can be, uh, can be exported in a, in a big text format or any other format that is suitable. So uh, dimensions.ai is a free platform. So you, one can use it. You can go there, register yourself for free. And one thing uh, over here I must mention that uh, dimensions.ai holds almost 70. They also declare it uh, themselves. They, they, they almost hold uh, uh, 65, uh, sorry, 75 to 80% of the resources which are available in Scopus. So they, they are not claim, claiming that they are as robust as, as Scopus. But almost 75 to 80% of the resources or 75 to 80% of the papers that are actually present 
uh, in scopus uh, they can provide you with they can uh, provide even dimensions.ai provide you with all those filters that scopus is providing so you can set the timeline you can set uh, whether you are uh, we want to have paper streamed in from the journal sources or from the books or from the edited volumes from the conference proceedings uh, from the web referrals uh, you can also select whether you want to have only the open access papers so that you can get the full pdf version quite easily uh, they they it can also be filtered uh, with the help of specific researcher you know if you have uh, a set of researcher who are doing excellent research who are the who are uh, the maximum contributors in your field of research and you want to know about their papers. So you can filter across the researcher. You can filter across geographical location. And if you also have this information that maximum uh, re um, uh, maximum research which, uh, which, which pertains to your field is coming from, say, 12 to 13 universities or institutions of higher education across the globe and you want to extract whatever uh, has been churned out from those institutions only you can also specify uh, that from which institutions you want to get uh, those uh, you know resources so dimensions.ai has uh, come up big time and it, it has posed almost a kind of a competition to uh, scopus and and the scholars have also uh, found themselves to be empowered uh, with the introduction of dimensions so that that's uh, that's a very good news so this is one of the platforms or the search engines, almost like a you know a database oriented search engine through which you can search out papers or resources for your research. The second thing that we spoke about in the last slide is about the content aggregators and the content summarizers. Particularly, you know, uh, I would like to talk about two platforms which we are using now. Uh, one is called the Connect Papers, and this is an AI-based platform uh, which creates certain kind of a network, you know. Uh, the network uh, basically is created on the basis of a paper or a source that you have identified, and you want to find out what are the relevant papers or what are the relevant contributions by the authors across the globe, which can be directly connected to this particular paper. So all, it's almost like a hub and a spoke model. At the hub or at the core, there is a single paper or a cluster of paper that you have identified as the critical or the focal paper base for your research area. And then you want to find out the entire network. Again, this is an AI-based platform which hovers across the uh, you know, internet and try to find out the papers and correlate with, your, with the hub that you have already created. Now, what does this, um, uh, this, this is what I uh, told <clears throat> is, uh, connected papers, okay? So one is connected papers and almost analogous to these or almost similar to uh, this uh, particular site, you have another site which is called Research Rabbit. So if I may say how connected papers actually work, uh, that I have told you in uh, brief. Now, <clears throat> uh, let me just show you one so that <clears throat> instead of uh, giving you uh, the information, if I can give you a very brief demonstration of how connected paper works, it will be beneficial for you. So I'm just giving you a very brief understanding of uh, how connected uh, connected paper actually works so, so that you can use it. <clears throat> Let me just open in a second platform so that I can show you.
So you just go to this uh, particular uh, website, which is called Connected Papers, okay, and uh, just click it. You can uh, do your registration. I have already registered myself, so I'm just uh, entering into this field just to give you an understanding how it works. So initially, if you have the paper in your mind, it's fine. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite acceptable. But if you do not have a particular paper in your mind, uh, you can make the initial search by using this uh, search box. And this search box will help you not only finding the core paper that you were searching for, it will search a core paper for you, or you can identify the core paper by seeing the list of papers that this particular platform has identified and searched out for you. And then you can build up a graph or a network, uh, which will allow you to understand which are the other relevant papers or resources which are directly attached to the key paper that you have under, uh, that you have, you know, uh, identified. So over here, you see, you can uh, search by keywords. You can search by paper title that I have already said that you have a pre, uh, you know, knowledge about a specific paper title. Uh, which is of extreme importance uh, and is connected with your particular research field or you have the DOI number or any other kind of identifier for that particular paper, uh, you can type it out over here. So let me just give a random term over here to find out certain papers. Uh, say I am going for sustainable development. This is a very broad term, so it will likely to fetch a lot of papers. Say, let me be very specific. Sustainable Development Goals, a paper written by Robinson et al. in 2016, say for this one, or say Sustainable Development Mapping Different Approaches. You can look from these papers also, uh, which is provided as a preliminary key uh, for searching out uh, papers. Uh, and if you feel that uh, one of these papers are very close to your research area, you can select here. So say, for example, I'm just randomly select one. Uh, selecting one uh, particular option, say sustainable development goals, and then I am allowing uh, this paper, this particular site, to build up the graph or to build up the network. You see, the network basically is in progress and it stabilizes after accessing resources across the net, okay, across the internet. And you will find a lot of uh, papers uh, with 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 the core uh, paper, you see at the very center, this is the core paper that we have identified, uh, the sustainable development goals. So if I am bringing the cursor over here, mm, it, it is uh, giving out that particular paper name. And then uh, we can have uh, this particular network, how these papers are connected. You see uh, the United Nations Development Program, or there is a cluster of paper over here. And whatever you are uh, hovering uh, on this particular network, and if you bring your cursor over a particular paper or on a particular resource, uh, every detail will come on the right-hand side the pane. Okay, you can search out papers from here also. Okay, so you can search from the most contemporary, 2020, 2020, 23, 17, 20, 20. And you, you can easily find out. And if you are clicking uh, this particular paper, if, if it is available, uh, is, suppose for this one, you, you have uh, detail of this paper on the right-hand side of the pane. And if you, if, if you want to set up a certain other filters, like say, for example, you want to set up uh, the time, uh, that this particular time I am setting, within this particular time span, I want to create a network. Uh, and I want to uh, see uh, how the you know papers are interconnected with each other. You can set the times also. Okay, so this is this is one of the uh, things uh, that we are using these days to have the preliminary idea that uh, where my papers are located with respect to a central or a focal theme, which which is being touched upon by a specific paper. After identifying a specific paper, I want to find out. See, that this narrows down the search a lot. Instead of you know spending a lot of time for randomized you know kind of a search, uh, it focuses the search and it narrows down the search a lot, thereby saving a lot of uh, time and resources and uh, you know effort uh, on part of the scholar. 
Okay, so this this is one of the tools that we are using nowadays. And um, same thing is with the research rabbit also. You know, in, in, in case of research rabbit also, you will find uh, that we are almost using the using the same algorithm or using the same AI based algorithm as that of the connected paper. Okay, so you can try out research rabbit or connected papers, either of these two platforms to generate the network of the papers uh, that you require. Um, and the visual representation sometimes uh, carry a lot of impact. And you, 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 in your mind also, you will be very clear from where these papers are originating and uh, which are the most relevant papers to the central paper uh, pertaining to my research problem or to my research theme and uh, how they are being panned out. Okay. And then we are using two content summarizers. These are the aggregators, the content papers and research rabbit basically are the aggregators. They aggregate the resources from this wide domain. And we are using uh, two summarizers. One is SciSpace. I think already some of you or many of you are using SciSpace. Actually, we used when, when uh, we started using ScholarC for content summarizer, uh, ScholarC initially was almost like an open platform but later on it became a very you know uh, kind of a paid platform and now probably i haven't used scholar c for quite some time now but uh, what i understand is scholar c is not a fully open uh, platform nowadays it will offer you with a chance uh, uh, to create a summary for one or two documents over a certain period of time, maybe 15 days or one month, and then they, it will start charging. But SciSpace and the Summarizer, these are two platforms which you can use, or I'm sure that you must be using these two platforms already, uh, which can summarize things for you. Now, here is a catch. The catch is, if any scholar asks me, or if any scholar asks a supervisor uh, that whether... Uh, we should be using summarizers at all or not because you know uh, summarizers are basically you are allowing the machine to read through and you are allowing the machine to summarize you are allowing the machine to extract the gist for you you are allowing the machine to understand uh, the implication or the inner meaning or the unmanifested issues uh, which are unmanifested or hidden issues which are otherwise explicitly stated implicitly stated in those papers uh, to what extent we should use summarizer okay um, this this is one of the debate uh, particularly when we are using open resource tool or open access tools or open uh, you know uh, source open 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 application tools uh, all the application tools are um, use of all the open ap application tools. So, you know, it may not be very um, advisable, particularly when it comes to summarizer. So it, it is all, all, all it is always a, a recommendation that whatever crunching you do, do summarization you do, you have to read through the entire paper yourself. And then you can take the help of the summarizer to make a comparative analysis that whether any additional, you know, thing is coming up uh, through this uh, summarization process. But aggregators you can always use because the location or identification of the paper across this huge domain, because, uh, you know, we initially used to have uh, uh, this particular search engine like Google uh, platform. And Google platform will search everything and uh, anything under the sun uh, with a specific you know, search term being created. So uh, again, there is another uh, you know, search engine which is called BASE, uh, the Biofield uh, Academic Search Engine. We also recommend scholars use BASE a lot because it is much more focused and it you know, pulls out you know, academic materials compared to other irrelevant stuff that, that is being regularly done by Google, okay? So these are the few tools uh, when it comes to, you know, database access, uh, streaming papers from the databases or, you know, uh, finding out a network uh, of the resources, finding out relevant papers which are connected to a core paper and then summarization of this or crunching of this entire uh, resources. <clears throat> Uh, then we come to the open uh, source uh, bibliometric analysis support, uh, which we, which I uh, myself use these days, is Biblio Shiny, which is one of the Shiny app, which can be 
um, used through the console of our studio. So the bibliometric uh, uh, support that we use, uh, or I personally recommend, is BiblioShiny because it is it is much more helpful, and the visualization or the data extraction or the bibliometric um, you know data extraction is nicely done over here. Uh, if I compare it with another uh, tool, say a lot of us are also using Voss Viewer. Okay, as a bibliometric analytical tool support, uh, VOS viewer uh, can fetch you certain uh, uh, certain visualization, but it is very restrictive in nature. If I compare it with Biblio Shiny, uh, which is uh, which is much more robust because it can bring out almost everything, every detail. Okay, it can bring out who are the most prolific contributors from which uh, you know country they are originating. Uh, the country-wise collaboration, the author-wise collaboration, uh, they are coming out with two specific uh, quantitative measure on the basis of citation, like Bradford's law, following the Bradford's law and Lotka's law. Uh, they can come with uh, the document features like the word clouds. They can come with uh, tree mapping. They can uh, come with the thematic uh, trend, evolution of the thematic trend. Uh, they can come out with the evolution of the keywords, they can uh, bring down uh, the entire uh, data set into time slices so that you can um, you can you can uh, suppose you are extracting data from 2020 to 2000 from 2000 to 2020 and that entire period of time can be time sliced say from 2000 to 2010 2010 to 2015 and 15 to 20 so over three time slices and again the time slices can be done by the researcher himself or herself. So the machine will not going to determine what kind of time slice uh, will be taking place. So they have left it to the researcher. So the researcher, if they feel that there has to be a five-year gap time slicing, they can do that. They can create a 10-year time slicing. So across these time zones, how a central theme or how the themes or how the variables or how the keywords have evolved, uh, this uh, this 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 can be easily visualized in uh, biblio shiny uh, plus it will give you a very nice perceptual map about the motor themes about the emergent themes about the base themes um, and about the key themes okay so it it will give you certain idea about what which are the themes which are very basic to your research problem and which have been studied over a period of uh, so many years. So it, it is almost, uh, you know, homogeneously distributed uh, as 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 a, you can say as a background theme uh, in your in your research in the context of your research problem. But having said that, it also identifies the emerging themes, the themes that have been studied in the last say five to six years only, and it's still evolving. So uh, Biblio Shiny not only helps you break down and uh, understand this bibliometric data, it helps you in identifying certain gaps that exist in uh, in the research. Okay, so that you can actually identify whether there are gaps in the theories, uh, whether there are gaps in the variables, whether there are gaps in the models or the frameworks or in the context. Uh, from, uh, whether there are gaps in the perspective so that you can actually come in and plug in. So one one of the um, recommendations that we always uh, give to our scholar is that I do not know um, whether it is a generally uh, you know acceptable kind of a, a view or not. But I personally follow this thing that the first uh, research paper that a scholar should bring out uh, will be based on the literature review or on uh, you know systematic literature review or on bibliometric analysis because if this paper is published in a good journal, that means your entire PR community is accepting uh, that this is this this particular study uh, is justified. Okay, or this this particular gap do exist. Now, once you are publishing in a big journal, or once you are publishing in a good journal, uh, having a very good circul circulation and uh, say a very high H index, uh, then you are actually establishing this fact. So uh, before you know, uh, you're waiting for you know data to be collected and then you are analyzing and then you are publishing a paper. Well, before actually doing this. 
I think this is a this is one of the options that you are having. Ask your scholar to make a very thorough study about the literature and the theoretical constructs. Uh, make certain very systematic analysis of that. Justify the research problem. Justify the gap to be explored, and uh, fit in with all the logic, and uh, publish a paper. Okay, so uh, bibliometric analysis support Biblio Shiny with the help of R Studio is one of the uh, open source application that we are using uh, for this bibliometric analysis. We are also using Voss Viewer uh, that I have already told you. You can also try out BibExcel uh, for this bibliometric analysis support or Sitescape. Uh, these, these are some of the open source tools which you can also try out. Okay, but these, this this bibliometric analysis support has uh, evolved as a you know big time tool. Uh, open source tool in recent times. Now, altmetric analysis support, the fundamental difference between the bibliometric analysis and the altmetric analysis is bibliometric analysis is much more scientific because it spans across the uh, published databases and it uh, is grounded on this published databases. Altmetric analysis is anything other than these, you know, structured and very scientific publications. So, uh, your appearance, uh, say, for example, your mention in the social media databases or social media platform or your mention in any other form of uh, web uh, platforms uh, whereby your peer group or you have shared your content and your peer group has, uh, has, has access to those resources, etc., etc. So in a kind, you are kind of an influencer. Now, uh, with your research work. So, altmetric analysis will give you uh, to what extent you have influenced your entire peer community uh, with your research work. So, that uh, gives you uh, an understanding of your impact over a wide domain of uh, peer network. So, you can use this impact story uh, for altmetric analysis. This is a uh, free source, open source tool, or altmetric. This altmetric, I think you have already used it. Uh, these are two tools which you can use for altmetric analysis support. And then comes the data analytical tool. Uh, so we have understood the databases like dimensions. Uh, we have uh, seen the content aggregators like, uh, uh, you know, um, connect, connected papers and uh, uh, this research rabbit. And we have understood the summarizers also. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have understood the bibliometric open source, bibliometric tools. And now we are coming to some of the open source data analytical tools. Uh, I have mentioned um, predominantly these three tools because these three tools are very robust in nature, robust in the sense that they, they can handle any different, any kind of data. Okay, otherwise, you know, uh, we are having one of the open source softwares, uh, particularly to analyze the quantitative data, which is called JSP or PSPP. PSPP is almost an anagrammatic representation of SPSS. So we, in, in cases that, um, you know, institutes or scholars who do not have access to SPSS as a proprietary uh, tool, they can always go for PSPP. Uh, otherwise, you know, Orange and Rapid Miner and Nine, these three are very powerful, you know, data analytical tools. If I, if I get time, I will show you how Orange works or at least, you know, uh, the interface of Orange, uh, which will give you certain idea that whether as a open source research tool, I will be using it or not. The same thing is with the Rapid Miner, and the same thing is with Nine. Both of these uh, two platforms can handle, uh, you know, multi-level data, uh, data with a different kind of morphological structure, and they can actually ensure very seamless transformation of data structure. And that, that is very important these days for machine learning to come in and build up models for predictive analytics or classification or clustering or, you know, any other kind of analysis. Uh, you need to have a very robust core that ensures a data transformation. Okay. So um, I personally these days use those open source tool which helps me in transformation of these data. Otherwise, you know, data in pure form uh, if you are using and you want to retain its, uh, you know, pure form, you have to use, you know, standalone softwares uh, for this one, another software for another kind of data, etc. 
So these three platforms can deal with structured data. These three platforms can deal with unstructured data. These three platform can deal with the big data, which is a mix of structured and unstructured data. So that's why these three open source platforms are very much uh, recommended. Okay, then we come to the open source AI tools. Uh, you see, <clears throat> I do not know whether you have uh, opened, uh, you have used uh, any of the uh, proprietary uh, qualitative data analysis software or proprietary uh, quantitative data analysis software, very recent version. I can just give you one example, like for example, in one of the qualitative data analysis software, which is proprietary in nature, I will come to the open source a bit later. But in 2023 version, uh, probably it was 10.6.13, that was the version, or 10.6.14. Anyway, it came out late in the 2023. The name of the software uh, is Atlas TI, which is one of the most popular tool that we are using. That, that is one of the proprietary tools, but still we do use it. So in that particular tool, in that particular version, which came out in December 2023, November or December 2023, in the initial opening console, uh, what we found for the first time is AI-based coding console. It was not there. Even uh, with, with the earlier version, uh, it was not there. So this AI version, AI-based coding console, it was a new introduction uh, in the qualitative data analysis uh, management. So actually what it does uh, in, 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 in case of coding data, I, I have gone through the tutorials, I have gone through the manuals, then I came to realize that actually even if you are providing this as a free tool, that means open AI tool uh, for coding the data, it is not advisable uh, for the scholars or the students or the young researchers to use these open AI based coding tools at all. Because uh, what I have gathered or what I have realized by talking to the experts we, who are actually dealing with this particular open AI tool is that when you are going for an open AI based coding, uh, you need to deal, you, you are supposed to deal with, again, uh, I gave you this example earlier that you need to deal with. Uh, millions of data that means the data which are um, you know uh, which are generated uh, at a single point of time on multiple touch points and interactions on the basis of millions of transactions that means uh, again i can give you the example of e-commerce platforms or the banking platforms any other financial institutional dealings or transactions social media platforms where trillions of data are being generated at a given point of time so no, or not a single researcher will have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this this particular uh, ability uh, to manually code these data. For that, you require some kind of a smart coding tool, uh, which is uh, based on AI. But again, um, the smart coding, but what what was uh, understood uh, by reading the texts or reading the uh, tutorials that the smart coding or the open AI coding tool, again, depends on the human intervention to a certain extent, okay? So the initial set of code or a kind of a code book or a kind of a cheat sheet that is produced by a particular human being or a particular researcher who is, uh, who, who is uh, uh, you know, examining a sample of the transaction data on the basis of the sample of the transaction data, he or she creates a set of, you know, code and, uh, you know, trains the machine that in all such cases where these kind of responses or transactions appear, the machine is supposed to, you know, generate or associate those transactions or touch points with that type of code. So you are actually training the machine uh, to develop a model on the basis of certain preset codes, which are uh, based on human intervention, so which are created by human beings. So even if it is coming to smart coding or AI-based coding, the initial input uh, that the uh, machine is receiving is a set of codes uh, which are prepared by the human beings. Anyway, 
the open source AI tools are helping us with two things. One is the NLP, the natural language processing. Most of you who are doing the text mining and the text analytics kind of thing, uh, they probably know this. Uh, this they, they are accustomed with this particular term, uh, which is called the natural language processing or the NLP. And the second one is the machine learning. So in, in case of natural language processing, Thing, you see the tokenization and breaking down big uh, chunk of you know uh, interview transcript into smaller segments so that it can be uh, really well taken up by the analytical software so the analytical process to to fit into some certain kind of an analytical framework uh, for coding purpose for annotations etc so um, the open AI, uh, open source AI tools are used for these NLPs and ov obviously for machine learning. Uh, machine learning has come up in a big way and most of the open source tools that we are using nowadays, I um, actually uh, endorsed uh, very heavily for Orange and uh, RapidMiner and Nime. All those three platforms are actually uh, using this machine learning to a large extent as a result of which that data transformation is possible. So any kind of model building, uh, predictive models, et cetera, et cetera, can be taken up uh, with the help of the open source AI tools. Now, one thing that has uh, come into our, uh, uh, come, that, that has come to our notice, uh, which, which is uh, very classified, uh, which is uh, a, a kind of thing which is limited to uh, certain research domains, so the research domains which are, you know, operating in the field of security, in the field of surveillance, in the field of forensics, uh, data, even data forensics, uh, is the open source intelligence or OSI and TOSINT for, uh, for um, uh, this kind of research and development purpose. So OSINT refers to, you know, collecting and analyzing information from publicly available sources on the internet. So these uh, sources uh, encompasses a very variety of data, including the websites, the social media platform, uh, different kind of forums, you know, news articles, public records, and uh, many more things. Now, what is the use of OSINT? If I if I think uh, use of this uh, open uh, source intelligent uh, kind of information. The use of OSINT can uh, be understood from three specific stakeholders or three specific users. The first user are those who are the big business houses. So we are not very interested in this particular forum uh, because they are using it as <clears throat> a business intelligence purpose for competition mapping, uh, mapping uh, for understanding the gaps in the market, uh, to enter into the new market, strategization with the new product development, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a corporate applications of the OSINT. The second one is the cross verification of information and building stories. These are very much used in the media studies, okay? Particularly the journalists, the editors, uh, they are using OSINT based information for this cross verification of the of, of news and information and build up you know authenticated stories on the basis of this cross verification and the third one what, what we can use as the researcher is to study the social behaviors the public sentiment particularly the opinion mining's uh, political uh, speech uh, analysis uh, and uh, certain emerging trends, uh, certain emerging trends in uh, different social settings. So use of OSINT can be basically studied from, or basically can be uh, uh, understood from these uh, three specific, uh, you know, users or stakeholders. One, the big corporate. Second one is very specific usage in the media domain. And third, uh, as, as academic researchers. <clears throat> Now, searching for this OSINT kind of data, we go for very specialized kind of search engines and platforms, namely Shodan and Census. Now, you see uh, Shodan and Census, both these platforms are open source, and these platforms can churn out data which are very classified in nature, okay? And you can get deep information about certain issues, okay? So you, anybody who are interested in uh, searching out uh, classified data, um, they can use this thing, either census or shodan. 
The second uh, source that is uh, a bit controversial, but I do not know whether you have heard it, probably you have heard it also, which are called the Google Docs, okay? And you have heard about a term called dark web. Uh, so Google Docs uh, basically uh, is the specialized search query, um, which, which, which is almost using almost the same analogy uh, as is used by Shodan and Census to identify uh, certain information which are otherwise not visible uh, or not at the surface in the general web search. Okay, so Google Docs are used to identify uh, the transactions, uh, the kind of you know um, conversations uh, that you know one group of people or one community or one individual is having with the other, uh, trying to understand. Uh, the opinions, trying to understand the views uh, from a very deeper perspective, try to, uh, trying to understand transactions which are not really visible uh, at the surface level. So Google Docs basically um, uses uh, this kind of search queries uh, to, to, to identify this. Now, um, another open source data that we are using these days, uh, particularly uh, to scrap data from the social media platform, because uh, we are seeing a lot of research is being carried out on the social media platform itself. Uh, even if we exclude the media science, uh, which is in any which in any case is basically attuned with these social media platforms, but other researchers, other social researchers from the social science or even from the natural science, they are using the social media platform uh, to extract information. So, um, because, we, you know, uh, the behavioral study, the study of the user generated content, to what extent uh, those uh, can be used as, uh, you know, predictor items or predictor factors, to what extent uh, the user generated content are uh, enacting as influencers. Uh, we are scraping data from the social media platforms. And uh, initially, you know, all these social media platforms like uh, Facebook or Twitter, which is now known as X uh, and Instagram, they used to distribute the free APIs uh, so that you can use the API to stream in the data. So if you are using a uh, data analysis software, I do not know whether you are actually using it. If you are using a data analysis software, particularly qualitative data analysis software, you will find that uh, the social media streaming is an integrated part of that software console. If you see the entire, uh, you know, uh, operatives of that particular software, it can be uh, a proprietary software or an open code software. Uh, social media, even in R, if you are performing certain qualitative data analysis in R, uh, we used to stream a lot of Twitter data uh, on the basis of uh, this API uh, protocol compliance uh, in our platform also. So the sentiment analysis and opinion mining, emotion analysis, etc., uh, could be done on these platforms. So initially it was available uh, that all these APIs, they, they you know, the Facebook, uh, Instagram and Twitter, um, they used to provide the customer secret and the customer key and the API number from the developer platform, whereby you have to prepare, uh, you, you know, you have to uh, create a developer app and you will have access to these things. But nowadays, you know, uh, it has been withdrawn. Uh, immediately after the switching uh, from Twitter to X, uh, we have found uh, a little bit of difficulty uh, in accessing these customer secrets and customer keys. Facebook has already stopped that. And the same thing is with Instagram also. It's a, we are facing a little bit of difficulty from other sources like Reddit or even in case of YouTube or LinkedIn, uh, the API compliance is still there to a certain extent. But without depending on these things, we are focusing on uh, something which is called the free source or open source web scrappers, okay? So we have the web scrappers and web crawlers. Are the, we um, Previously, we used to have the web scrappers and web crawlers, which were proprietary in nature. So we, have to, we, we, we uh, were required to avail or access the paid services. But uh, recently, we are using web scrappers and web crawlers, which are uh, available as a free source. One such web scrapper uh, is Scrapey. 
uh, you can use it. You can scrap out uh, web information from any of the social media sites uh, with Scrapey. Uh, there is another one which is called the Beautiful Soup. Uh, that, uh, that is also a very uh, strong uh, web scrapper or web crawler. Now, which can stream in data from X, which, which can stream data from Instagram, which can stream data from Facebook also. And those uh, researchers who are doing research uh, on these three platforms, so using the social media platform as a uh, you know, data generation platform. Uh, then we have the social media management tools uh, like SocioBoard and Hot Wood Suit. Okay, we used to have uh, SocioBoard um, now, what is exactly a social media management tool? It, it, it prepares the dashboard based on the information that we collect from one of the social media sites. So I can show you uh, how the dashboard looks like uh, for SocioBoard. This, this, this is a SocioBoard dashboard uh, whereby you can arrange all the pertinent information that you can drag from a particular social media platform based on a specific user-generated content search. Say, for example, I'm just giving you um, an example how a researcher can use it. Say, for example, a virtual ethnographer or a digital ethnographer becomes a part of a web community or a forum uh, who is having their existence on this kind of social media platform. And he or she has taken prior consent from this particular group to access their, you know, uh, content or user-generated content. Uh, it may be, uh, this particular research may be on the participatory basis or on the basis of pure observation, non-participatory basis. But since you have taken consent, with the help of the social board, you can actually organize the pertinent UGCs or the user generated content on a single dashboard for your presentation or for the visualization purpose. You can It can collate a large uh, amount of user generated content on a single dashboard. So that is one of the um, you know, use of uh, this uh, uh, particular social media uh, management tool. Again, it depends on one of the scrapers through which you will be scrapping out the UGCs or the content. Uh, and then you can prepare these kind of dashboards. Same thing is with Woodsuit also. Uh, it will help you to prepare the dashboard. Um, then we come to something which is called the text analytics. Uh, some of the text analytics that we again use, uh, the open source text analytics is Spacey. Again, we come back to Orange, which is a very robust text, uh, text analytical tool because you have a separate, you know, kind of a, a panel for text mining altogether. Okay. In case of Rapid Miner, also, there is a text analytical, uh, you know, platform. Uh, Spacey is basically a text analytical tool uh, with the help of which we can go for text mining and text annotations and all that, uh, which is again um, an open source tool. Now, open source reporting tools, whereby you prepare your reports, you prepare your dashboard. Uh, I know that uh, these days uh, we use uh, one particular, you know, a visualization tool or reporting tool or which prepares multiple dashboards and then amalgamate and collate all the dashboards into a single window, uh, which is which has become very popular. It is called Tableau. Tableau can handle very uh, pertinent quantitative data as well as string data with the help of which it can develop multiple number of you know dashboards and those dashboards can be easily you know, appended in a single big uh, window, uh, which is again, uh, you know, it is termed as as a master dashboard. So there are certain, uh, you know, sub dashboards or sub, uh, you know, uh, smaller dashboards, which can be appended in a bigger dashboard. But again, Tableau is basically uh, proprietary in nature. So we, uh, we are looking for certain open source reporting tools, uh, which could help us in preparing certain a uh, very visually interactive dashboard whereby you can present our results, uh, we can present our analysis in a very nice way. So one of the open source, uh, I will uh, speak about few of the uh, open source reporting tools, like uh, one of the open source reporting tools that you can use is Jasper report. 
and uh, Jasper report, uh, when it was uh, first launched, it was only an acting as a uh, reporting tool. That means amalgamation of all the dashboards and appending them into a single larger you know, dashboard. But later on, Jasper Soft came into uh, the picture along with the Jasper report and Jasper Soft actually allowed you to analyze and uh, prepare the report on the same platform. So you, you did not go to a separate platform from, uh, for analysis and bring the entire analytical uh, uh, output to a uh, separate platform for preparing the dashboard. It was not required anymore. Um, we have several others like Pentaho, you know, uh, so these these are some of the open source reporting tools which makes your presentation and reports much more interactive and visually appealing. Okay, so you can try out these things also. Now there are certain open source applications or platforms uh, which I told you about the LCMS uh, in uh, one in 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 our previous discussion just uh, a few minutes back we talked about the learning and content management uh, you know uh, platforms so over there um, there are a number of content uh, generation tools okay uh, which will help our content much more interactive and much more versatile in nature which are open platforms like a tutor it can prepare your digital content or e-learning content much robust now, there is another one which is called Thinkific. If you are using Thinkific, you will find that uh, you, you can do a lot of animation uh, and developing interactive content with the help of this. Docios is another one. Talent LMS, it's, it's a whole new LMS platform, which is not only hosting your study materials or the courseware, uh, but it, it can also help you, you know, uh, develop the content also. And two of the most uh, popular things uh, that we use, one is the Moodle Cloud, uh, which uh, I think uh, most of you are using also. And the second one is the Canvas, which I am using, uh, the teacher's version, which is uh, freeware, <clears throat> which is a free platform. So uh, these are some of the open source application platform, which help you in uh, boostering your, you know, e-learning content or um, the content uh, that you have created to be disseminated across the virtual platform okay um, open in learning you can access this particular uh, uh, you know uh, platform also which is which is uh, which is providing you with an option to go for uh, the open e-learning system you, you can develop an entire system of your own if you have your own website, actually, you can integrate the open e-learning source uh, to your own website. And um, it, it will also provide you with a, with a, with a bouquet of e-learning authoring tool too. Now, there are certain open source image annotation and voice annotation tools that we are using nowadays. <clears throat> uh, one of the open source image annotation tool that we are using uh, these days uh, is called uh, thing link um, and the voice annotation tool that we are using is called the voice thread. Now I have uh, found these two tools uh, particularly open source to say you see thing link and voice thread uh, they have as I have told you in our discussion that uh, initially when certain tools or when certain uh, you know application platforms were launched in the internet to support the research and uh, learning uh, kind of a thing. Uh, initially, they were launched as a proprietary version, but later on, depending on the demand and the use, uh, they launched their free version also. So these two annotation tools, so both the voice thread and thinglink, they are having their free versions also. Okay, so you can use the voice thread and thinglink. Or thinglink basically it's an image annotation tool. I can tell you about one of the uh, application. Uh, of uh, thinglings, so, suppose um, most of you who are habituated of disseminating uh, study materials or taking class through the e-learning platforms or using the LCMSs, initially we faced, particularly I can share my experience, that I faced a lot of problem uh, because I could not provide my students or the learners uh, to use the same platform and navigate across different resources. So in most of the cases, what uh, used to happen 
uh, if a content is provided on a certain platform, even it can be a Google Classroom or a Moodle Cloud or whatever it is, uh, to access certain resources, a learner or a researcher, uh, they used to open multiple number of tabs okay, across uh, your window. Uh, so these tabs are very distracting. You are switching from one particular, uh, you know, uh, page and moving to the other page. Uh, it is very distracting and disturbing at the same time. So um, initially the thought came into the mind that whether I can actually uh, help my uh, learner or the researcher to stay on the same page and navigate from the same page itself. There, there was another problem also. Uh, like when we are developing something for the MOOCs um, and if we are following the Swayam uh, mandate or uh, UGC MOOCs mandate, uh, we are supposed to develop MOOCs uh, by using a four quadrant approach. One of the quadrants uh, in the four quadrant approach is providing web references or uh, web materials or web resources to the students. Okay, so as soon as you are providing the students with a bunch of web resources, you are actually compelling them to open up multiple windows, multiple tabs to access those resources. So it also becomes very disturbing at the same time, uh, opening up multiple tabs. So uh, the issue was, the, the problem was, can we create a content uh, with the help of certain freewares or free tools or open access tools uh, whereby we can create a multi-layered content. That means uh, I, I can create a content and then I can put a layer on that particular content. Then I can put a second layer on that content. I can put a third layer or a fourth layer on that content. And every time a researcher or a scholar or a student or any other kind of a learner needs to identify or, you know, um, uh, extract all those materials uh, from the single e-learning content, he or she can click on the same content and can be directed to that particular page. So it is not required from him or her to personally open several tabs and go for the search engine, place the web referrals in the URL, and then push the enter button and try to find out. So these multi-layered annotations, particularly visual annotations, can be created by the open source ThingLink uh, platform, which is an image annotation thing. Now, uh, this 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 has become very helpful, particularly on on the virtual platform when 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 uh, transactions or you know uh, teaching learning is taking place or sharing certain resources with my scholars or researchers is taking place on the virtual platform, even uh, when you are collaborating with someone who is sitting at, uh, at a very you know, uh, distant end of a country or your collaborator is situated in some other country and who is not very accessible uh, physically, uh, ThingLink plays a big role in, in, in image annotation and the real-time annotation can take place, thereby exchanging things. Okay, a similar thing can be done with the help of voice annotation, the free version of uh, the voice annotation or the open version of the voice annotation. Uh, the voice thread basically uh, provides you with a direct interaction with your scholar, with your student, with fellow researchers, with collaborators, uh, by virtue of recording the voice and tagging it with the content so that there can be instant feedbacks, okay? So if you are posting certain voice threads on your LCMS or uh, on your website or, or uh, even on your as a YouTube content, uh, those voice threads uh, can be easily replied back to in the form of voice itself or in the form of text, in the form of images, et cetera, et cetera. So those, these two things are uh, pretty interactive in nature and uh, it has given, you know, uh, unidimensional uni content, almost a very three-dimensional look, okay? Uh, so both these things converted a very flat kind of data into a very multi-layered kind of a content. So that, that is, that the, these, these two platforms I found personally very useful uh, whenever it comes to sharing content is concerned across this uh, e-platforms or virtual platform. 
and then there is another uh, open source uh, virtual interactive tool uh, which is uh, uh, which is now used uh, at the school level also but we started actually using it uh, from 2021 onwards almost 2021 mid of 2021 uh, which is called padlet uh, padlet basically it's a digital wall okay initially actually it has come down to the school level also uh, because uh, most of the teachers and the students have found it very interactive uh, digital media, uh, which is again a very open platform whereby instant communication uh, is taking place. So you are raising a question or you are raising a question uh, with your own voice, with your own video, with your own image. And the reply is coming like that only with the image or the video of the of the student or the scholar or the teacher or the collaborator uh, almost instantly. And what is interesting about all these three things, so one is uh, the voice thread and the thing link and the padlet, anything which is done on uh, these three levels uh, can be taken up and can be posted uh, in your LCMS. So that in your LCMS, um, the, the person or the students or the learners who are hooked into your LCMS, they need not have to open up any other window, any other separate window to access voice thread, any other separate window to access ThingLink, any other separate window to access Padlet. So all these three things can be uh, actually appended in your LCMS only. So uh, uh, we can have a, a demo of uh, these uh, three things also. Uh, along with the orange uh, uh, application as a free source uh, kind of a thing uh, so that you can understand how to use it because merely uh, having a very theoretical understanding of these things without having uh, an essence of how it actually works or how it may work and provide certain insights uh, for our learners and the researchers or the users uh, it is not very uh, useful uh, as I may feel. Okay, so uh, these are the um, bouquet of the uh, open source, uh, you know, tools and applications uh, or what we uh, very uh, lightly pronounce it as uh, open source application tools, so the software, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, open source platforms that we are using nowadays to conduct our research, uh, to conduct our uh, teaching learning process on a regular basis. Okay, so uh, what can we do? Should we take a five minute break uh, at this point and then we can start again? Or should we just continue up to 5.30? Sure, sure, Okay, so we are taking a five minute uh, break and then, then we can uh, continue with uh, some of the application, how it actually works uh, with, with, with our LCMS that we will have a look into it. Thank you.
Okay, am I audible? Yes, sir, Abda, you are audible. Okay. So, uh, before just uh, going for uh, showing some of the uh, open source tools that we have uh, talked about, uh, uh, let me take some of the questions. If you have, uh, then we can proceed. Let, let let us make this part of the session a bit interactive uh, because uh, these are the things that uh, for most of you may uh, I, I think you have using you are using some other tools other than this that I have talked about uh, for, for some of these tools may be new or the tools that you are using at this moment uh, they may be new to me also so uh, before moving ahead, let us try to understand where we stand uh, in in this particular context. Then we can take it forward. Okay. So at this particular point, if you have any query or if you have any question, uh, you can ask so that we can take it up uh, on a very interactive mode and then we can go for this uh, uh, demos. <clears throat> Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, I am Onupam, sir. I am asking for transcribing audio files. Uh, is there any AI tool like Otter? Otter AI I heard, but what is your uh, take on this? Actually, I used Transana a lot, but uh, Transana, uh, actually, it's, it's an AI-based tool, but unfortunately, Transana had certain limitations. Uh, that after a uh, certain number of transcription, it uh, again uh, takes up a few days before uh, it allows us to uh, go for transcription. You can you can use one particular tool called O Transcribe. Okay, o, o, o Transcribe. And that that is one of the tools that uh, can be very handy. Or there is another one which is called uh, Express Scribe. Okay. Okay, you can search it in the internet. You probably will get it. Expresscribe, I didn't use it, but I have used Inscribe, I-N-Q-S-C-R-I-B-E. -E. Inscribe works well. Okay, okay. but uh, I, um, I do not know how these uh, uh, other tools are working, but Transana was very good. And unfortunately, there is another one uh, uh, which, is, which is probably uh, Hyper Transcribe or something like that. Uh, but Transana was really good. Unfortunately, it is not fully you know, open sourced, uh, so I could not use it very on a very you know repeated basis. So that is like that. <clears throat> okay, sir. Sir, and one more thing: when we are uh, like asking Scholarsy or uh, Skyspace to summarize the article, then do they hallucinate like ChatGPT or perplexity? No, see, uh, the simple thing is uh, the machine is uh, trying to summarize on the basis of the actual words that are there in the text. Okay. Now, identifying uh, those texts or identifying those, uh, uh, you can say, uh, understanding the meaning which is, which is uh, lying very deep in, in, in those texts. It, it requires you know special skill so sometimes if you are over dependent on the machine for summarization they will they will just restrict uh, themselves at the very surface level without entering into a 
uh, into the deep level. What human intellect can bring out, it's very difficult to match. Okay, that's why I, when, when I told you during the time of our interaction also, I never recommend summarizer. I recommend content ag aggregators because it saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of effort uh, actually for the researcher. But when it comes to summarization, there is no alternative but to read the paper and summarize yourself. Okay. Otherwise, uh, depending on the machine for summarization, the machine will run its own interpretation, own algorithm. So algorithm-based summarization will be a very dry output. It will not contain the output which is uh, which will be uh, which 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 we which we can say a very intellectual output or a very meaningful output output in the context of your research problem. Okay, so summarization is not uh, advisable. But as I have told you that you can make always make a comparison between a machine generated summarization and the summarization that has been done by you. And then you can find out, OK, if there are certain wide gaps, uh, you try to reconcile why those gaps are coming through. That you can do. OK. OK. okay sir. But Thanks. summarization, I never recommend. Uh, there is one question which was put forward by uh, Vinit Kumar. We use OpenRefine for fetching data from API and further uh, data cleaning. I'm concerned about the scalability of the... Uh, scalability is, is one of the concerns of Orange. But since uh, we are uh, dealing with the data, so particularly if you are streaming data from certain social media sites, or certain e-commerce sites, or even from the OTT platforms, if you are streaming data about uh, customer touch points or clicks, et cetera, et cetera, or usage or navigational data or user-generated content, the, those data, uh, basically the, the gamut of the, 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 that particular data is pretty large. Okay, as a result of which, uh, you know, there, there are certain issues. Uh, there could be certain issues, although I didn't face that is issue uh, with regard to Orange since I didn't deal with that much of a data. So scalability, I don't know if you have faced one, uh, but uh, the extent to which I have uh, used Orange with uh, limited uh, data, I didn't face that uh, that kind of... Like for... Uh, I have used Orange particularly for the most... Uh, most abstract kind of data because um, I can give you um, with what uh, with regard to what I am using Orange. I am using Orange uh, for image classification and image clustering and text classification and text clustering, particularly image classification and clustering. Uh, so it has limited number of images streamed out from the uh, social media site or uh, even the images taken for the field work. Uh, so the number of images, say, it ranged from 200 to 300. Okay? So uh, even Instagram images, which were streamed out, uh, ranged from uh, 200 to 300 images in a given data set. So there, uh, you know, running a particular machine learning algorithm and then fix up a classifier and a learning module and then prepare a model for the prediction of the images or then you know, fitting a classifier, a logistic regression or an SVM, uh, then classifying the images. I did not actually feel uh, the problem, but I do not know with the, the kind of uh, large data set whether uh, it will be possible. But uh, scalability, I didn't hear uh, from anyone that uh, Orange has given a scalability problem, but I do not know because I didn't deal with a large data set.
Any other question? Okay, so uh, yeah, any other question? Does Coursera has orange learning course? I haven't checked this out. Um, I'm sorry. But uh, orange has a number of modules, small, small modules on YouTube. Uh, but it doesn't give you a very comprehensive uh, kind of an idea about uh, the application of orange. But orange comes out with a very uh, voluminous uh, manual. If you can get a hold of that particular manual, go through that particular manual, it gives you a nice idea how to use it and how it operates. Okay, that you can do. Even if you are getting, uh, you see, Orange, uh, apart from Orange, you can also use the Rapid Miner. But uh, Rapid Miner, some of the researchers or some of the scholars have made a con uh, complaint that Rapid Miner is a bit of resource hungry in nature. So if you do not have a very robust kind of a system, it may hang your system to uh, a certain extent. So uh, compared to Rapid Miner, I think Orange is much more user-friendly and much more uh, light uh, as far as uh, the executions are concerned. Uh, but I do not know whether Coursera or any other you know, e-learning platform is offering uh, Orange Learning so or not. Okay, But I, as I've told you, there are small... Uh, video tutorials from the uh, you know developer of the orange themselves uh, in YouTube. You can go through those videos to have a preliminary idea about uh, how to bring in the data, how to purify the data, how the data, etc. Any other question? <clears throat> okay, so. Uh... Seems uh, there are no further questions. So uh, let me just uh, show you some of the things that uh, we have discussed so far, uh, so that uh, to a certain extent it becomes helpful for you to uh, use it. Otherwise, you know, if I make this uh, pure theoretical you know, presentation, uh, don't help. So I gave a demonstration about this connected paper. Now, uh, let me just, uh, since I do not feel the requirement of going to the dimensions.ai, but for some, uh, maybe uh, this uh, tool of Orange may be new. So I'm just uh, showing you how it works. Okay, so uh, this is one of the open uh, tools that we, we are using uh, on a regular basis. Uh, this is one of the most prolific tools uh, for the researcher who is researching uh, not only uh, on the basis of uh, qualitative data, but also on the basis of quantitative data also. And I will also give you uh, some understanding about, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, one, one particular uh, 
image annotation tool that I have talked about, uh, that is ThingLink, okay? So you enter the ThingLink site and you register yourself. Uh, the registration is absolutely free and then you can log in and you can start doing things. <clears throat> Okay, so this is uh, something uh, which we see in the opening uh, page of uh, ThingLink. Okay, uh, so there are multimedia editor, the scenario builder, the guided tools, uh, all these things are there. And there are, you know, several modules. Okay? And all your modules are stored in this media. Uh, fine. Um, and to start with uh, this thing link, as I've told you that it will give you certain idea about how you create thing link. Uh, over here, you see a blue button. So you go to create. Let me show you one of the finished files of the thing link so that you understand how uh, the end version looks like. Let me open up one particular picture so that... So suppose, uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, one of the content that I, that I created uh, on one of the courses on sustainable development where a lot of uh, discussion took place on the mangrove uh, preservation. So you see uh, the fundamental uh, picture or the image that uh, was used in this, uh, uh, in this particular e-learning content or the base picture is a picture of the mangrove. And then you can see uh, three yellow buttons are there. Okay, so this is the base picture or the first layer of the e-content. And then I have created three more layers. One uh, picture within that particular picture. The second one uh, is a textual content and the third one is a video. Okay, so if I, um, that, that particular thing that I was, sharing with you that if I want to share something with uh, my students or with my scholars, I uh, would like to arrest their concentration or focus on that particular page or of that particular, you know, web platform uh, so that they did not have to navigate to other areas. So they did not have to, you know, uh, go and search for things. So it is almost like, uh, you know, helping them narrowing down the focus or it's almost like helping them navigating through uh, the multiple resources. It, it's almost like a guided tour. So the first layer of picture that uh, was created, if I click here and if I click here, uh, then uh, it will be automatically redirected. Okay, so the biodiversity of the mangroves, uh, it will be automatically redirected. So if the particular uh, uh, student did not have to open a separate page uh, for this okay so that is that is one of the advantages of of, of thing link uh, that we are seeing okay and uh, the second one uh, is and you, you can go through this entire thing uh, as, as a as a learner you can go uh, deep into uh the content of this particular thing and and the second uh, uh, objective of the thing link is to uh, create a certain uh, videos which are extremely relevant if you are providing a static image uh, for your learner uh, the second thing that you can provide is a video uh, that particular video again uh, if you are clicking on the video resource, uh, it will be uh, taking you to that particular video uh, source so that you need not have to search for this video. So, uh, what I am trying to say is you are provide if you are providing a web URL or if you are pro providing the address of a particular site, then the student probably have to open up, uh, you know, uh, that particular thing, that particular site and eventually he or she will be distracted from that particular site. Or instead of doing that, we can, we can help the student stay on the same platform and then can use it. 
So if I uh, go back over here and show you how you can create it. So you, if we are uh, just clicking this create and uh, we can use an image. So I do not know whether we are having an image. So I can just uh, take one image from here. So I have taken one, taken one image uh, from here. Um, so over here, I I am already seeing that there are certain annotations being made. So it will not work. So let me uh, drag and drop certain images from the folder. So if I'm having an image, say for example, I need to see. <clears throat> Give me a second. So, say I'm just randomly selecting an image. So So this is the image uh, based on which you can actually start working uh, with ThingLink and you can create uh, multiple layers on this particular image, okay? So the layering can be done by using several tools which are available on the image, uh, on the ThingLink console over here. If you come to the initial console, uh, the initial uh, dashboard, from here you can select a multimedia editor or a scenario builder. Okay, uh, I am using both these tools, the multimedia editor and the scenario builder to develop those images. So multiple layers on that particular content and it can be done very easily. Okay, I, I have just shown you how to, uh, you know, incorporate a particular image and these tools like, in, you know, in case of multimedia uh, editor, you have a number of choices to select from uh, what uh, kind of editor you, you will be using. Or in case of a scenario builder, if you if you want to include a particular type of uh, scenario uh, to be inserted in that particular image, you can do that. Okay. So this is ThingLink, and uh, similarly we can use the voice thread also in the same way, which is uh, image annotation, uh, voice annotation tool. Meanwhile, we are just uh, uh, let it uh, let us uh, have a quick look into the voice thread. Uh, sorry, the Orange platform. Now, this is the initial, um, you know, look uh, of the Orange platform. Now, why I recommend or why I use this, you, if you see and if you scroll down uh, this entire uh, vertical navigational panel in the Orange platform, you will find uh, that it can handle uh, multiple corpus of data. So it can handle quantitative data uh, it can handle qualitative data. It can uh, handle the visualization in various forms uh, uh, because ultimately visualization play a major role. Uh, it can develop model, both the supervised model and the unsupervised model, particularly the supervised model like the survey vector machine and the KNN and the decision trees and etc. Uh, it can go for evaluation. Uh, it can go for unsupervised learning that I have told you, that I like uh, neural networks and all that. Uh, it can develop the prototypes, image analytics. This, uh, I have given, given you an example and I, I will show you how to use this image analytics. Uh, even the bioinformatics uh, people can use uh, this Orange platform. Uh, text table, uh, this is one of the, uh, you know, arrangements uh, with the help of text analysis can take place. Uh, text mining, you can see the old Twitter logo is already there. Uh, can You can bring in a lot of social media data directly streaming in this particular platform. You can conduct the sentiment analysis. Uh, you can go for topic modeling. Topic modeling is an excellent tool for identification of themes. So this, this, this is one of the use of this uh, open source platform. Um, a lot of things, spectroscopy, 
so this is this is a very robust platform but one uh, one thing i need to uh, say or inform that those people who are already using orange uh, they know it very well but uh, for the first time user probably when you will be installing orange for the first time you will not get these entire options the entire you know tray of uh, uh, activities or activity tabs okay so what you need to do is to click the option over here and you click add-ons. So once you click add-ons, you will find a list of add-ons that you are really interested in because you do not require all the add-ons over here. So if you feel, okay, I need image analytics or I need certain things uh, which is related to bioinformatics, uh, bioinformatics or I uh, need say text mining uh, kind of a thing or I am interested in time series. So you just uh, simply check the blue box and click OK. So all the add-ons will be taken up and then you can find everything is uh, over here. OK, so uh, just uh, giving a brief idea about how this open source uh, tool work uh, over here. Uh, so let me go for image analytics because images are one of the most difficult things to interpret, uh, to classify. Uh, they are so subjective in nature to apply certain kind of a tool on them and then to build up a model or a kind of a classification is pretty difficult. Okay. So in, in case of an image, how, how Orange actually works, it actually works by uh, creating certain link across the widgets. Each and every of these nodes and termed as widgets. So we can bring one widget over here. It's just a drag and drop, drop kind of a thing. Or... Uh, you can just double click it, it will appear, okay? <clears throat> so you can bring a one widget, like this is one of the widget which is called import images. So if I double click it, it will allow me to import certain images. So I'm just uh, randomly importing certain images from one of the drives where uh, uh, certain images are stored in. Uh, say, for example, mm, <clears throat> Okay, so I have certain images of food. Uh, so I want to just select this folder. Okay, you see 45 images were loaded. So I'm just closing it. Now, if I uh, touch uh, attach this particular node with, uh, with a data table, say for example, if I... Say I'm attaching this node with a data table. Now, if I see this, uh, probably what kind of uh, data is stored about these images? See, these are only the very fundamental basic meta information about the data, about the image. We have uh, size in pixel, width and height, etc. So these are very insufficient data to, uh, to run a machine learning. Okay, so uh, to classify or to cluster these images, we need image descriptors. Okay, so what is an image descriptor? So image descriptor is a kind of a vector representation of the images, which will help us profile the image in a certain way. Okay, so how we can do that? We can do that by attaching this particular node with another node, which is called image embedding. So what image embedding does, image embed converts the raw images into their vector representation into a multi-dimensional feature space so that each and every image is represented with the help of a set of random, randomly generated numerical codes. Now, after this embedding process actually uh, takes place very remotely. You see, already the embedding has been done. One, uh, one of the most, uh, you, you, you can say, uh, attractive or one of the most effective uh, things of this Orange platform is if your connectivity between the widgets of the nodes is very logical in nature, the operation or the analysis will automatically take place at the backdrop. See, I have not uh, clicked any uh, separate uh, analytical uh, tab or tab or uh, button which, which uh, talks about analysis or talks about run the application process, etc. So once you connect it in a very logical manner and the connection, if it is proper, then automatically the analysis takes place. So this image embedding is done uh, uh, on the basis of the millions of trained images that are stored in Orange servers. And this is done automatically. So now if I look at the data table once more, 
you will find that these were the initial data and now see how many image profilers were generated. See, there are almost uh, 2,043 image profilers being generated by uh, this image embedding process. So these are basically the image descriptors. And now we can actually run uh, uh, either a classification or we can run, uh, you can say, a clustering process. Okay. So if I uh, want to learn uh, a classification, say for example, I'm going for clustering. So if I am going for clustering, say I am going for distances, the normal way we are going for uh, clustering. The, uh, normally in case of images, the cosine distances are measured and then we are going for hierarchical clustering. I'm not going into the technicalities. I'm just showing you how this open source platform is helping us you know, analyzing one of the most subjective data that we deal with. So I am attaching another node, which is called hierarchical clustering, and you see the clusters are created, okay? Now, uh, one thing we need to uh, uh, note over here, uh, say, for example, if I attach a node called image viewer over here, we need to see what kind of images we brought in, because we have not seen the images. We have seen their vector representations or numerical codes, but we haven't seen the raw images. So let us click this. You see, these are images of food items, okay? All the food items uh, that are normally displayed on the sites of the online food vendors like Zomato and Swiggy and all these stuff. And they normally actually use this kind of a classifier and clustering to help, you know, uh, provide some certain kind of classified information to the customers and help the customer to take a decision on the basis of this visual interaction the visual representation of the food item and the customer's decision. So um, let us take the hierarchical clustering result now. Uh, okay, so this, this is a hierarchical cluster result. So for example, if I want to see this, I am selecting this result. I want to see whether, uh, you know, uh, if you see at the image again, uh, there are images of burgers, there are images of wraps and rolls, there are images of salads, there are images of pizzas, there are images of sandwiches, etc. So they are assorted food. I just want to cluster them so that in each cluster, all these five different kinds of food are clustered properly. So whether the machine has identified the cluster properly, uh, we want to check that. So we have highlighted this particular cluster to check whether the foods are properly clustered or not. And then I am attaching an image viewer once more. You see, all the salads are clustered properly. Okay, so this this is this is one tool that we are using these days for clustering and classification and uh, other different kinds of model building uh, based on which the predictions can be made, based on which trends can be analyzed, based on which this classi uh, classification and clustering can be done. So, and this is pretty easy. So you, you, if you are using this particular thing, uh, it makes your uh, data, see one particular thing I forgot to mention that uh, this particular open source tool, uh, why it is considered to be very robust because it has converted a very subjective data into a very objective, into its objective representation before applying certain uh, techniques which are pretty statistical in nature. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you have raw images, uh, it's very difficult to crunch with the help of statistical software. So this data transformation also takes place very smoothly on these kind of platforms. So uh, the same thing happens in Rapid Miner also. The same thing can be done with the help of R and Python also. Uh, the the one, only one thing that, uh, that is to be understood that this orange software is basically based on the Python coding. Okay. So if you are using NIME, it is your choice in which particular open source platform you are comfortable with. But I find Orange is much more uh, user friendly compared to that of Rapid Miner or NIME. So you can perform the text analysis also from here, the sentiment mining, opinion mining, everything. And as far as the visualization is concerned, I have shown you that there is an entire pool of uh, visualization. Like, for example, uh, if you want to uh, take this process one step further, 
and in you want to analyze okay i have got my clusters whether the clusters are having any uh, quality or not whether the clusters are of quality or that those clusters can be finally consolidated by the user uh, then you can uh, go for the shilut plot also the shilut analysis which talks about the uh, quality of the cluster so it, it's from here so you can drag a shilut and then you can attach a node with the shilut and you can get it okay so this is all about uh, you know clustering classification use of orange that that as a result of which we find uh, this thing as uh, very interesting okay uh, so this was one of the demo that I uh, wanted to show you. Uh, the other things you can try uh, for yourself, okay? Because uh, this particular platform or this particular session does not provide much scope uh, to have a very elaborative kind of uh, demonstration about all these uh, things, okay? So uh, now if you have any further question, you can ask. Otherwise, uh, we can... Uh, wind up the session. <clears throat>